Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on enlarged prostate treatment. My name is Jan, and I'm a nurse specialist at Benedon Hospital. Our expert presenter tonight is consultant urology surgeon, Mr. Steve Garnett. This presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon, which is on the bottom of your screen. And this can be done with or without leaving your name. Please note that this session is being recorded if you do provide your name. If you would like to book your consultation, we will provide contact details at the end of this session. I'll now hand over to Mr. Steve Garnett and you'll hear from me again shortly. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, thank you everyone for joining this presentation this evening. I hope you find it useful. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, I'm uh, Steve Garnett, one of the urologists yep. at Benetton and um, obviously Jan is one of our nurse specialists who helps uh, us look after our uh, prostate patients. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about a little this evening is um, about prostate enlargement itself, what causes it, what symptoms people get from that, um, how we diagnose this and, and various treatment options. But in particular, this evening, we're gonna be focusing on aquablation a little bit more, uh, which is a new robotic procedure, which has recently been introduced at Benenden Hospital. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about other treatments such as Eurolift and uh, TURP surgery, and there'll be some time for some questions at the end. So um, very briefly, don't need to spend too long on me, but um, I've been doing uh, prostate surgery at Bellenden for uh, you know, 15 years or so now. And um, uh, I was fully trained in the UK and also spent a, a bit of time in Germany. And I've been practicing in the NHS in East Sussex uh, since 2012. In fact, before that, uh, 2008 I started but uh, became the lead for the urology department in 2012. Um, so in terms of um, prostate enlargement what we're really talking about and focusing on tonight is benign prostate enlargement which is also called BPE. Uh, also used to be called BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia and these terms are really trying to distinguish that from enlargement of the prostate due to prostate cancer and in fact BPE is much much more common uh, and most people uh, with prostate symptoms will have benign prostate enlargement. And this particularly affects men um, uh, as we get older, particularly from the age of 50 and increasingly more so as we get older, such that by the time uh, men in their 80s, nearly 90% of them will have a degree of benign prostate enlargement uh, causing variable symptoms. So uh, in the UK, it's thought that at least 3 million men uh, have urinary symptoms associated with benign prostate enlargement. So this is just a little diagram that explains, a you know, shows you a bit more vividly really what we're talking about. So you can see on the left that the prostate here um, is situated underneath the bladder and there's a nice open uh, channel or water pipe Technically, we call this the urethra, which runs through the prostate, and it's nice and open in this normal situation. But when the prostate gets enlarged, it doesn't just grow outwards, it grows inwards and it compresses the urethra. So you can very easily see why in that situation, men would have a reduced flow and difficulty passing urine. And that has knock-on effects on the bladder and it indicates a little bit here, but the bladder wall becomes thickened and then the bladder itself works uh, differently and less effectively. And that can lead on to not being able to empty the bladder completely. Uh, and then also wanting to go to the toilet more often, what we call frequency and getting up a lot at night. So why do, why do men get this? Well, it's clearly linked to testosterone. Testosterone stimulates growth in the prostate but exactly why uh, uh, or what that uh, what causes that stimulation, we don't really know. Um, and it may simply be, uh, you know, the accumulative effect of testosterone over time. But it's clearly uh, has some genetic factors to that as well, because not everyone will get this. And in fact, not everyone who gets benign prostate enlargement will get particular symptoms. In terms of symptoms, um, 
as you saw in that diagram, the prostate is normally quite a small gland um, situated just underneath the bladder and in, in, deep in the pelvis between the, the bladder and the penis, really. And as the prostate gets enlarged, it, it blocks the way out, squeezing and compressing the urethra. Uh, and that can cause, as I said, difficulty starting to pass urine, going more often, poor flow, difficulty emptying the bladder, getting up more at night. Over time, that can lead also to another symptom of urinary urgency of having to rush to the toilet. So in terms of if, if any of those are ringing bells or you're worried about prostate enlargement, what can you do? Well, you can see your GP and in the first place, uh, uh, many GPs are able to uh, assess your symptoms using things like symptom questionnaires and asking exactly what sort of problems you're getting. But if you're referred on to uh, the hospital, you might get further tests such as assessment of the prostate size, uh, in particular, something called a flow rate, which is when we uh, get men to basically pee into a, uh, a machine, which is like a big funnel that measures how well you're passing urine. And, you know, urologists get a bit obsessed by these flow rates because they're actually very useful at telling us how much uh, or what degree of obstruction you're getting from your prostate, how bad your, 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 your degree of blockage is, and can actually also indicate what treatment might be best for you. And we usually combine that with a quick scan of your bladder afterwards, because as this process progresses, men generally find it more difficult to empty their bladder. So there's this concept of bladder failure when the bladder stops being able to squeeze all the urine out and you leave more and more urine behind. And eventually, if that's not treated, you can end up to the point where you can't pass urine at all. And that's called retention of urine. So in terms of treatment, if the symptoms are very mild, you may not need any treatment. You may simply want reassurance that there isn't anything more serious going on. You may be able to manage these early symptoms with lifestyle changes like reducing caffeine, thinking about how much you drink and when, that type of thing. But if the symptoms are more uh, bothersome, more severe, uh, in the first place, there are medical treatments that can help relax the prostate or reduce the size of the prostate. But leading on from that, if that's not enough or you don't want to take tablets or you're getting side effects from tablets, then there are uh, procedures that can be done on the prostate to relieve these problems. So we're going to talk firstly about aqua ablation, which is this new robotic procedure that uses high pressure water jets to uh, ablate the prostate. There is the uh, most commonly performed standard operation, which is the TURP or transurethral section of prostate. Uh, which we also do at Bennington, and the Eurolift procedure, which is another relatively new procedure, which is minimally invasive, that uh, allows us to improve symptoms without any uh, cutting or destruction of prostate tissue, and this can be done as a day case. So aqua ablation is a fairly new, minimally invasive, uh, robotic-assisted procedure, and that means that it's actually... Um, uh, well, it's, whilst it's controlled by the surgeon or, or, or me, it's the robot that actually uh, uh, directs the water jets uh, according to the plan that uh, I've set out based on the uh, information gathered at the start of the procedure. And it uses high pressure and high, high velocity water jet to remove or destroy this excess prostate tissue or ablate it. And by doing that, it relieves the pressure on the urethra and opens up that urethral channel to allow a good flow. So it's performed under general anesthesia um, because it's important. There's no movement uh, once you're in position, uh, but there's no cuts uh, or incisions at all. Um, we've recently um, started doing this at Bennington Hospital. This is a quick picture of the team and some of the equipment in theatre. Uh, this is, you know, a pretty major investment for a private hospital and there aren't that many centres uh, performing this across the UK because uh, the robotic equipment is expensive. So this is a, a, you know, a major and very exciting development for Bennington Hospital. So to talk a little bit more about what actually happens, um, 
in, in essence, at the start of the procedure, an ultrasound probe is placed that allows us to very accurately, uh, in real time, image the prostate. And by doing that, we can use the ultrasound to plan the treatment. So um, what we then do is precisely target and remove the excess prostate, prostate tissue using this high pressure water. But we're using the ultrasound to map out the prostate and then plan and essentially map a plan onto the real-time ultrasound of how much prostate we want to remove. And in actual fact, that allows us to be very precise. And uh, we then send that information to the robot, which controls the water jet uh, to remove exactly the right amount of prostate tissue and protect sensitive areas, particularly those that can be involved in sexual function. So the other part of the procedure is a camera and water jet probe, which is placed in down the urethra and into the bladder through the prostate. And then the, the robot controls that and um, we slowly pull back the, uh, well, the robot slowly pulls back the water jets to ablate the prostate tissue uh, through the prostate uh, under real-time imaging with the ultrasound. And we're usually doing that with a one-night stay in hospital. And you, uh, you would have a catheter in for that one night. So this is just a little video to try and uh, explain a bit better than, than, than my words as to what's happening. So what this is showing you is that the handpiece that goes down the urethra is in place and the uh, image in the bottom right is the ultrasound. We've already mapped out how much prostate we want to remove. And as the procedure starts, the robot controls this powerful water jet. And the little picture in the corner there, you could see it as it looks like down the uh, telescope. But in the graphic there, you can see the water jet we're able to very precisely delineate how deep we want this to go. And just using that high pressure, it uh, ablates the prostate tissue according to the map, which is the green dotted line that we've set out. And at the end here, there's the area that is particularly involved in ejaculation. And we can very carefully and safely um, just ablate uh, tissue at the side and save the uh, ducts and uh, uh, factors uh, uh, that are involved in ejaculation. So this is why this procedure uh, is associated with fewer side effects in terms of sexual function. And there's no associated risk of erection problems and much, much lower risk of ejaculatory problems. Uh, so, yeah. So um, it doesn't affect sexual function. These are the benefits really of aquablation. It doesn't affect sexual function. It does appear to be a reduced recovery time and very little uh, post-procedure uh, pain or discomfort. Um, and pe people do seem to recover quicker than standard operations. And because it's robotic, we would be very precise in the amount of prostate and which bits of prostate that we want to remove and destroy. Um, and that allows us to, as I said, preserve um, essentially the ejaculatory ducts which are involved in ejaculation. Um, in terms of side effects, all, all operations or procedures can have side effects, uh, particularly uh, when we're doing this type of thing, there's always a small risk of infection. So we would give you antibiotics if you're having this procedure. And often people will have some blood in the urine um, for a few days up to a couple of weeks afterwards. Um, but these symptoms are usually quite mild and resolve fairly quickly. Often in the first couple of weeks, patients do notice passing little bits of uh, debris, uh, if you like, from the uh, procedure um, that's painless. But you may notice little flecks in the urine for the first, first couple of weeks. Um, so it's uh, suitable for men with um, bothersome urinary symptoms due to enlarged prostate. And it's actually suitable, unlike some other procedures, it's suitable for uh, pretty much all prostate uh, shapes and uh, most prostate sizes. It's not ideal for very, some men have very small prostates but still have symptoms. It's not ideal for that, but otherwise it's suitable for most people uh, as long as you don't have particular uh, other conditions that predispose you to bleeding. The other uh, sort of more commonly done procedure, uh, certainly nationally, um, is the TURP or transurethral resection of prostate. 
Uh, that's a procedure that's been done for over 40 years now, so it's very well known. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the side effects and risks of this procedure are very well documented. Uh, and you often read a lot about the, the, the side effects of TURP, uh, but actually it's a very effective operation and we know that it works well. And doing this procedure, again, a camera is put down the water pipe, the urethra, and uh, an image put onto a, a screen. And by using that image, we can cut away or scrape away the inside of the prostate using electrical energy to cut through the prostate. And little chips or small pieces of this are uh, cut away bit by bit to create a nice open cavity. Uh, and it's, as I say, it's a very effective and good operation, but it does have uh, well-recognized side effects and particularly on sexual function. So most men having this operation will uh, suffer ejaculatory dysfunction and a number will get uh, erection problems. And there is also a very small, but uh, there is a small risk of um, incontinence. It's rare, but it can happen. Uh, the other procedure we do a lot of at Bennington Hospital is the Eurolift procedure. Um, now, this is uh, perhaps the least invasive of all the treatments we have currently um, for prostate enlargement. And it's, it's been around a little while now, and it's a proven minimum invasive treatment that uh, I think fits um, or sits well between people who don't want to keep taking medicine uh, but don't want to have a, a more invasive uh, procedure. And in this uh, procedure, as you can see here in the little diagram, little implants are placed that pull the prostate open. Uh, some people you know, liken these to treasury tags, but essentially these are little uh, metallic implants that are fired through the prostate, and then uh, the prostate is compressed and tensioned to be pulled open uh, as you can see in that picture. So this improves the flow and improves the bladder emptying and improves the symptoms. And uh, as there's no cutting uh, or no destruction of prostate tissue, it does have fewer side effects and doesn't have uh, any uh, ejaculatory uh, effects and uh, doesn't cause any problems with erections. And that all sounds great, but it's not suitable for everyone. And I would also say um, that it is a slightly smaller procedure and it has a less dramatic impact on symptoms. So it's a, it's a good option, but it doesn't cr create such an improvement in flow or symptoms as some as the other treatments. And the jury's a little bit out on quite how long it lasts. We don't know if uh, uh, people are, gonna, are more likely to need further treatment. It says on here local anaesthetic procedure, but actually we generally do this under a, a short general anaesthetic because it is a little bit uncomfortable to do it under local anaesthetic. So I'm going to show another little video here to um, just, uh, again, make it a little bit easier to understand what, how this works and what this involves. Now, this does start off with an American voiceover, and I'm going to try and cancel that because it's a bit grating. I'm blocked. Real there we go. So... This is a, a sort of schematic representation of the prostate, and that's a telescope going through the prostate down the urethra. And this is how we fire the implants through the prostate. We'll just come out now through the prostate to the outer capsule of the prostate and then tension that back to compress the prostate and pull the inner uh, part of the prostate away from uh, the urethra or, or, or open up the urethra by doing that. Generally, uh, depends on the prostate size, but generally we're putting in about four of these implants to fully open the prostate. So as you can see, there's absolutely no um, cutting. So uh, there's no risk of uh, damaging other, other structures with this. But as I said, you do get a less uh, dramatic um, improvement in flow. There we go. And that's the, the view that we would see looking down the, the cystoscope or the telescope into the bladder. So I'm going to stop uh, talking there. That's a brief overview of the 
three main procedures that we do for prostate enlargement. Each has their pros and cons. Um, and I think what's what I feel is really important uh, as, as, a, as a doctor you know, treating patients with these type of problems is to really identify what it is that you as a patient want uh, in terms of outcomes and work out what procedure is going to be right for you. Um, as I say, they're not all suitable for every patient and the Eurolift in particular um, is limited a little bit on prostate shape. So that does affect um, who would be suitable for it. But I will at this point stop and hand back to Jan. And if we've got any questions, I'd be very happy to take them at this stage. Uh, lovely. Uh, thank you for that really interesting presentation, Mr. Garnett. Um, yeah, and we do have a few questions. Um, one of them I think you have possibly already answered in the presentation, but it's how long does the acclimation surgery take and when does it have to stay overnight? Yeah, so the, the acroblation procedure takes about an hour. Um, that's actually more to do with setting everything up because we have to get the robotic arm in exactly the right position and get the ultrasound image all, all uh, precise um, and get everything in line. And, that, and that's really what takes the time. The actual ablation part of it or the actual kind of operating on the prostate bit really only takes about 10 minutes or so, but there's a lot of setting up and checking and making sure we've got everything in the right place and making sure the images are perfect and then planning the treatment. So that's what takes the time. Um, some places, some hospitals are, are doing this as a day case, but you will need a catheter in overnight. And I, I prefer personally, and what we tend to do at Benenden is to say, if you're gonna have a catheter in overnight, we think it's better that you stay in the hospital overnight and then have the catheter out in the morning. I know that other places send people home with a catheter and then bring them back a day or two days or three days later. But uh, I think it's nicer to get the catheter out as soon as possible and feel secure that um, whilst you've got the catheter in, if you've got any problems, you're being well looked after. Thank you. And also slightly on the same um, question trail, can it be done under a spinal anaesthetic? The thing about the acroablation is it's really, really important that there's no movement. And the problem with the spinal uh, is that, um, you know, the patient undergoing the procedure may start coughing or breathing more heavily. So we do really only do it under general, um, certainly at this time, because we can control that. Um, so we can, if need be, control your breathing. Uh, we can certainly won't be any coughing and things once uh, once you're under a general anaesthetic so that's really important because we don't want you to suddenly move whilst we're in the middle of uh, the water jet ablation thank you um, and what percentage of men may suffer from retrograde ejaculation following the aquablation so the the figures for um sort of standard turp or there are other ways of doing that laser kind of uh enucleation of the prostate in those, in those procedures, about two thirds of men will get retrograde ejaculation. The documented figures with um, aquablation are around 11%, 10, 11%. Um, it may actually be lower for full on retrograde ejaculation, but um, the, I, th I think it's best to think of it around 10%. So it's much, much lower, but there isn't an absolute guarantee about it. Thank you. Um, are all the procedures a permanent solution or can symptoms return? Whatever you have done to the prostate, there is a, a, a risk of symptoms returning. Now, it seems to be that the more um, prostate tissue you uh, remove or destroy, the, the less chance there is of symptoms returning over time. So if you take the sort of standard TURP operation, we know that 80% of men at 10 years after the operation are still happy and haven't needed anything else doing, or to, or to turn that round, 20% have needed something else doing. So that's one in five. With the Eurolift, we know that that figure of 80 and 20% is there at five years. So it does look like the Eurolift is a smaller procedure with fewer side effects, but probably more likely 
uh, that you will need something else doing. But you could argue that if it's a small day case procedure with few side effects, does it matter so much if you need it repeating after a few years? So that's a, a personal thing I think you need to consider. With the acroablation, because it's new, we don't have long-term results. There are some five-year results out, which looked very good, if anything, slightly better than TURP. Um, but we don't have 10-year results yet for acroablation. But I would expect people to get very good lasting results from the acroablation because we are removing a lot of prostate. Thank you. Um, and do all of these options mean no more tantalosin? Yeah. Yeah, the idea would be to stop your medication. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, somebody's just got a query. I'm 76. Would that be a problem? <laughs> what, you're too young? <laughs> no, uh, no. I, age, is, age is not an issue. It's just fitness for, you know, what's, what's, um, what's going to be appropriate for you. It's really a fitness for general anaesthetic or uh, other, you know, or, or spinal if you're having a TURP. Um, so it's not age, it's just how, uh, how well you are. Thank you. Um, do these procedures have any impact on the subsequent likelihood of developing prostate cancer? No, uh, there's, there's nothing to suggest any of these procedures have any impact on uh, developing prostate cancer, either, you know, either preventing it or causing it. So when you're doing these procedures, um, what you're doing is removing generally what we call the, um, what's called the transition zone of the prostate, which is kind of the central part of the prostate. And we're not removing the full, the, the whole prostate, which is a much bigger operation with, uh, which is done for cancer, which has other side effects. But it's, in fact, it's the outer bit, the peripheral zone where prostate cancers tend to happen. So uh, this, this procedure is not a cancer treatment, but it does not increase the risk of prostate cancer. Thank you. Um, if I've had a Urolift procedure and then needed something more comprehensive, are the Urolift pins removed? And if so, how? Yeah, they they are just uh, they just come out. Uh, well, as as you can see from the Eurolift um, uh, picture that I showed you, or the or the video as well, there are two clips on the Eurolift. One is on the outer part, what we call the capsule of the prostate, and one is on the inner bit, and that's what we call the urethral end plate. And that urethral bit is removed during TURP or aquablation, and those internal metal clips come out. The bit that is on the outside of the prostate is is not that's not possible to remove that that would stay there, uh, but essentially you can go on and have further treatment without any problem and those internal clips are removed. Thank you. Um, and is the Eurolift a day treatment with no overnight stay? So the, the Eurolift is done as a day case procedure. Um, there is a small risk of uh, so with most people having a Eurolift don't need a catheter being put in after the procedure, but sometimes people can get a bit of bleeding, a little bit of blood in the urethra, or may find it difficult to pee because the prostate can swell up a little bit straight away after the procedure. So there's a small risk of needing a catheter. And again, if that happens at Benenden, we generally say, um, if we put a catheter in, stay in overnight and have the catheter out the next day, you could technically go home with a catheter in and come back later um, if that happens. But for the majority of patients, the Eurolift is done as a day case with no catheter. Thank you. Um, with the aquablation, how do you determine how much tissue to be removed? So that's what I'm saying about the beginning of the procedure. We're accurately mapping out the prostate um, in, uh, in its different sort of dimensions. And once we've accurately mapped out the prostate, we, we use the computer program to draw a treatment plan uh, onto the image of the prostate so we can see exactly how much prostate tissue we want to remove how deep to go in which part of the prostate which parts to save um, and essentially we're drawing or mapping a plan onto the computer system that the robot then follows thank you um, and a patient here says he has been seen elsewhere and recommended to have a small resection. Would the aquablation then be a viable alternative? 
Um, potentially, it, it is difficult to answer specific questions because it does depend a bit on the size of your prostate. Um, but uh, and they and it, de it depends what your consultant means when they say small resection. So I don't really know exactly what that means. It's it's a little bit imprecise, but potentially you would be suitable for aquablation. Yes, uh, but I would really need to see you and get a bit more detail. Um, and how different is aquablation to the HOLEP treatment? So HOLEP, I haven't really talked about. That's a laser procedure, which is similar. More, I think it's better to think of the HOLEP as like the TURP. So the HOLEP uh, uses laser. HOLEP stands for homium, homium laser enucleation of the prostate. And essentially, that's using laser energy to core out the prostate, whereas the TURP is using electrical energy to core out the prostate so it's what you use to cut through the prostate but both of those procedures are cutting through the prostate to remove prostate tissue and um, both of them have similar side effects in terms of retrograde ejaculation and incontinence um, so the acroablation is the only uh, procedure uh, that allows uh, you, this more accurate uh, real-time uh, ultrasound imaging of the prostate and then mapping a treatment onto that. And it's also the, the, the treatment with the lowest rates of sexual dysfunction. So it's, it's, I would say that the HOLEP is a, is a very good treatment, uh, but it's more similar to the TURP than, than aqua ablation. Thank you. Um, does diabetes have any impact on prostates? Well, diabetes has a big impact on bladder function, and uh, but it doesn't specifically affect the size of your prostate, but it can affect your symptoms to a large degree. So um, people with diabetes can get um, nerve-related problems through the diabetes, and that can affect bladder function. So that, that can uh, have a big role in the symptoms, but not so much directly on the prostate itself. Thank you. Um, is a higher than normal PSA a sign of enlarged prostate that may not be cancer related? Yes, absolutely. So an enlarged, uh, an enlarged prostate will, the bigger your prostate, the more PSA you will tend to make. So if you've got an, uh, a slightly high PSA, those what, what's called high PSA, that's related to a, a value that's considered to be normal for your age. But if you've got a particularly large prostate, you will make more PSA. So um, what we prefer to look at rather than simply just PSA level on its own is what we call PSA density, which is a way of taking into account the size of the prostate, because if you've got a large benign prostate, you will have a slightly high PSA. And that doesn't mean um, that that PSA level doesn't relate to prostate cancer in that situation. It relates to having a large prostate. Um, thank you. So if I've been taking medication, tamsulosin and dutasteride for approximately the last 15 years, but they seem to be less effective, is surgery my next option? Um, I think it's very likely that it is your next option. Um, you, you know, you, again, we need a, a few sort of tests and assessment, but really, um, depending on the sort of symptoms, you've really been on maximum medical treatment for quite a long time. And if it's still despite that you've got problems then i would think you need to look at surgery yes thank you and um, i'm sorry i'm just scrolling through um what is the what is the chance of a catheter causing damage to the urethra could it cause a stricture um it's it's not common to get a stricture after a, a simple catheterization um uh, I'm I'm in an slightly because obviously uh, the, 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 there are lots of different circumstances in which catheters are used and how they're placed. So a straightforward catheterization is very unlikely to cause a stricture. However, if there was difficulty placing the catheter, if there was trauma caused during the catheter placement, then that could lead to stricturing. And stricturing is uh, what happens when you get scarring in the urethra and the urethra becomes tight and narrowed and you get problems passing urine because of that scarring in the urethra. Now, as I say, it's uncommon after simple catheterization, but it's possible. It's also possible after infections, and it's also possible after 
uh, instruments being passed down the urethra. Thank you. Um, how much discomfort do patients find in the pre-op uh, investigations, i.e. insertion of a camera? So I'm presuming someone's maybe talking about a flexible cystoscopy. Yeah, so one of the commonly used investigations prior to uh, these procedures is called a flexible cystoscopy. That's a local anaesthetic insertion of a camera down the urethra to look at the prostate and the bladder in more detail. Um, I would say that a lot of, well, most men who you mention this to um, go a bit white and don't like the sound of it at all and get very worried, which I completely understand. It does sound like it's going to be uh, an unpleasant procedure. But what I would say is my experience, uh, particularly at Benenton, is that it's done in a very uh, professional and uh, quick and competent way. And nearly everyone who we've done it on uh, turns around and says, oh, that wasn't half as bad as I was expecting. And it really is a very quick procedure. It takes really less than five minutes usually. And I do find quite a few patients come to us having had bad experiences elsewhere and um, actually say, oh, that was so much better than uh, it was last time. And I think it depends you know, quite a lot on the experience of the team doing it. And sometimes in the NHS, um, these procedures can be left to um, some, some of the more junior doctors. And I think it is better to have it done by someone uh, more experienced. Uh, thank you. Um, and from this presentation, is the application a better option than resume? I think we didn't mention resume. I didn't talk about resume. Resume is uh, what's called um, well, steam is steam treatment of the prostate. I would say resume is more is a better comparison for resume is is the um, urolift procedure. So the aqua ablation. The robotic procedure I was talking about is a much more um, uh, powerful and much more effective treatment. Resume during the resume treatment, um, uh, a camera is placed down the urethra, and through this, a needle is placed directly into the prostate, and steam is injected into the prostate. And by doing this, you can destroy prostate tissue. But it's um, much a much smaller effect than the aqua ablation. And uh, if it's much more limited in size of the prostate and it's much more limited in the size of uh, the effect or the, the improvement in symptoms. So it is a smaller procedure and that's the advantage of it. But um, everyone has a catheter afterwards, usually for four or five days. Um, and quite a lot of patients need multiple treatments. So they may have half the prostate treated, sent home with a catheter, have the catheter out after four or five days, then come back in four weeks and have the procedure repeated on the other side or the other half of the prostate. So it's a smaller procedure, uh, but I think a bit less effective and not really a direct comparison with the aqua ablation. Thank you. Um, is the procedure appropriate to assist with erectile dysfunction? None of these procedures are designed to help with erections. Uh, and uh, you should seek other treatment if, if that's your primary concern. The, these are not designed and don't help to improve erections. Um, and would having uh, Pironi's disease have any impact on the um, So we haven't really got time to go into Pironi's disease in, in depth, but this is a, a condition that affects um, erections. But um, no, that, that sh should not make any difference to having any of these procedures. Lovely, thank you. Uh, with Eurolift, do the presence of the pins affect having future MRI scans? Um, yeah, you, uh, they affect it in that uh, when you've got these metallic implants in your prostate, if you have an MRI scan, you'll get a little bit of blurring of the MRI images for about two millimeters around each of the uh, internal clips. So you can certainly have an MRI. You just need to let them know that you've got Eurolift implants. Um, you can have an MRI, or as some people ask me, it, it won't set off airport scanners. You can have an MRI, um, but you just need to let them know that you've got the clips in, and it does cause a little bit of blurring around the internal clips, but that should not uh, affect the usefulness of the MRI. Um, thank you. 
Um, and this question, um, all of these options obviously will relieve symptoms of BPE, uh, but does it make it harder to monitor or pick up prostate cancer at a later stage? No, I mean, um, all, so um, basically when you're removing prostate tissue, so acroablation, TRP, HOLEP, you are removing uh benign prostate enlargement so you would expect in patients who've had these procedures for the PSA to go down so in fact it can make it easier to monitor for prostate cancer because the PSA should go down it should be uh, much more within the normal range than it was when you had a large prostate with the Eurolift after you've recovered from you know the first couple of months after the procedure it has no impact on the PSA uh, and as I said, it has a slight impact on MRI scans, but not in a way that would make it more difficult to check for or monitor for prostate cancer, no. Uh, lovely, thank you. Um, and there's a couple of other questions, basically from patients who have maybe had previous procedures, um, wondering if acrobation is suitable now. And I think the answer for that is probably you would need to review each patient on a basis to yeah i mean it depends what procedure and when and um i think in that situation we usually probably need to do a few more tests but uh, the starting point uh would be essentially no just because you had a, a previous procedure does not mean that you cannot have um something else be it aqua ablation or or urolift but i would have to take you know that on an individual basis Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, if you could just move to the last slide for me, Mr. Garner. Try it. Hang on. Yeah, that was that one. No, the other way. Oh, the, oh sorry. <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't answer all of your questions, but if you've provided, if you've provided your name, we will answer via email. As a thank you for joining this session, we are offering the value of your consultation refunded upon booking and a callback from your dedicated private patient advisor. You will also receive an email tomorrow with a recording of this session and further information, and you will also receive updates. If you would like to discuss or book a consultation, our private patient team can take your call up until eight o'clock tonight or between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday using the number on the screen. We would be grateful if you could complete the survey when this session closes to help improve our future events. Our next webinar is on hip replacement surgery and you can visit the Benedin Hospital website to sign up. So on behalf of Mr. Garnet and the expert team here at Benedon, I'd like to say thank you for joining us tonight and I hope that we will hear from you very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.